Hi, and welcome back to our second day of the Medical Packaging Conference put on by DuPont Medical Tyvek Packaging. We are so excited to have you back today uh, for an exciting second day talking about usability as well as a septic opening. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Everyone is coming in as um, muted. Uh, you won't be able to speak during the presentation. That doesn't mean, however, if you have questions that you can't ask them. You'll notice that there's a little pop-out box on the side of your screen, and there's a little uh, triangle that says questions. You can uh, pop that down and enter your questions there. Um, we are going to now move into the agenda. Um, hopefully everyone had a great time yesterday. I am Jennifer Binokin. I'm a medical device uh, manufacturer specialist and regulatory specialist with DuPont. I've been here for about four years and um, in industry for close to 30. Uh, today's agenda includes a, a great presentation by David Grusso Ventrup, and he'll be sharing with us uh, some basics on uh, doing a usability evaluation. And then we'll move into a quick 15-minute uh, video uh, showing two different hospital settings, one in the EU and one in China. Those will be moderated by Thomas Karras and uh, Dr. Selena Chin. After that, we're going to have about a 45-minute live discussion and Q&A panel where we'll bring in Melinda Elamari, and we'll be having a great discussion there, and that's where your questions will come in. With that, I am going to have them um, have David. Oh, wait, sorry. Sorry, um, this is live. Uh, the lawyers needed to get their word in edgewise, and this is a disclaimer that basically says everyone that's sharing their um, information today, it's their opinion, it's up to you to use it at your discretion. Um, however, we're not responsible for how you use it or, or what you use it for. Um, so, David, I'm going to have you get going right off the bat. Um, just to let everyone know, all of the panelists will be introducing themselves as we open the Q&A panel a little bit later. And um, yeah, so let's let's go, David. Thank you, and welcome everybody to today's first talk. My name is David Ruhventrup. I am a HF engineer and head of design science Germany. At Design Times, we have over 30 years of experience in usability, so I'm very happy today to have the opportunity to give this talk. During these special days, we all know what the consequences of the wrong touch or of the hand or an object can be. And this is all the more true for operating room settings, where one wrong touch can lead to the infection of a patient with potentially dire consequences. To avoid this, we'll talk today about the usability evaluation for aseptic presentation. So let's go ahead and quickly look at the agenda for today. I'll start by quickly glancing over the regulatory background, even though I'm sure you're all very familiar with that, and then we'll dive into the usability engineering process. I'll give you a short introduction about what usability engineering actually is, and then we'll look at two specific aspects of it that are most relevant um, in the context of a septic presentation, which is on the one hand, risk assessment, and on the other hand, the actual usability evaluation in accordance with ISO 11607. So we'll quickly start with the regulatory background. And uh, I'm very sure you all have read the medical device regulation and its requirement that uh, leads to prevention of microbial contamination and has the requirement to allow ease and save of handling for medical devices. More specific, ISO 11607 in section seven talks about a documented usability evaluation. And this is exactly what we will be talking about today. I'll start by talking about the usability engineering process. And in this context, there's uh, one guidance and one standard that is most relevant. For the standard, we have the IEC 62366. And on the other hand, we have the FDA guidance applying some factors and usability engineering to medical devices. Those two are fairly similar and um, we'll treat them as if they are almost the same today. There are some specific differences, uh, but we'll not go into these details today. So 
So at the bottom, you see the different phases of the usability engineering process. And um, I could talk for hours about this process, but today I just want to highlight some of the aspects that are most relevant in our context of uh, sterile packaging and um, aseptic presentation. So at the beginning of the usability engineering process, you would always start with looking at your users, finding out who your users are, because every user group and every user is different. And in order to create a product that fits the needs of your users perfectly, you need to understand who you are designing for. So users might differ in terms of physical ability, sensory um, abilities, cognitive abilities. They might have different language skills, different knowledge, cultural, different cultural backgrounds. And all these things need to be considered in order to create the perfect product for your users. The next thing you would look at when um, starting the, uh, a new development and uh, applying the usability engineering, you would use, look at the use environment. So what context is your product being used in? What are the lighting conditions? Is it, is it light? Is it dark? What are the noise? Is there background noise distraction? Um, how are the users interacting with your product? Um, do they wear gloves? Um, are the gloves dry or wet? All these things impact how you would design your device or your product in order to make it fit to your user. Next, we'll skip a couple of steps um, and jump directly to the establishment of a user interface evaluation plan. And this is very important because in this step, you plan and you detail how you want to assess the usability of your product. This interface evaluation plan details how and what usability tests you intend to do, what user groups you want to test, um, how many users per user group, um, how the actual tests will be, will be run, where they will be happening. Uh, and all of this needs to be established beforehand in order to be sure to have a reliable outcome of your test. As one of the next steps, and of course, again, I'm skipping a few steps in the middle here, we have the summative or the validation studies, depending on whether you're in the US or in Europe, the terminology is a little different, but they're essentially the same. So these are the actual usability tests that you're running. And um, these are run, of course, in accordance to the user interface evaluation plan. So this is what you actually do to show that your product is safe and effective. Next, I just want to highlight one aspect of the usability studies, which I always find most interesting, which is the root causing. So whenever we observe an error or a mistake or to see that a person is struggling in the usability study, uh, we do what we call root causing, where we try to determine the underlying cause of the difficulties that is happening. And of course, the easy answer is always, oh, my participant is too dumb. He doesn't understand it. But if you dig a little deeper, you find that there's more to it. And um, the design of your product or your packaging might actually be causing the problems. It could be that the user did, for example, not see the flaps where to open the package, or he needed too much force to open the package, or maybe he just didn't understand the label. And to find out what really caused the error or the difficulty, we do the root cause of the test. Again, I'm skipping a couple of steps here in the usability engineering process and jump right to the end where you evaluate the residual risk. So this is what we do after you, you, the usability test is finished during the reporting phase. Huh. So sadly, oh, we do not I'm live not in a perfect world. So, there is no product in this world that is completely risk-free. There is no thing as, such as a perfect product, even though, of course, we strive to create it. So every product has a residual risk. And um, during the evaluation of this residual risk, we go ahead and discuss each difficulty and each use error that we observed during the test and determine whether or not uh, the residual risk here is as low as reasonably possible in order to then determine uh, whether or not the product is safe and effective 
and can be brought to market or not. So this concludes my little introduction about the usability engineering process. And next, I want to be a little more practical and talk and show you some of the tools that we're actually using in usability engineering um, during this usability engineering process. So in the background here, in, on the green layer, you can see um, a product development process with the phases of discover, define, design, implement, and evaluate. And um, even though these are called slightly different in each company, I would hope that you're able to recognize your own product development process. So in the blue boxes, um, in the middle, you can see the different tools that we use, or actually some of the different tools that we use in usability engineering throughout the development process. And I just want to go ahead and highlight a few of these tools so you get a better understanding of what usability is actually um, all about and what we practically do all day. So let's start with some field research. Field research is where me or my colleagues would go into real life hospital settings or operating room settings, as you can see here on the picture, and we observe actual surgeons, actual nurses interact and do procedures in a real life environment. We do this to, well, see what goes wrong and what could be better in order to then um, make conclusions about how to improve a certain product or a certain process. Another tool is contextual inquiry. This is similar to field research, um, but it is a little more detailed. So we look at specific aspects. Um, and here you can see a little video of a laparoscopic um, procedure. We have a three camera view here and I'm just gonna roll this video. And I'm not sure if you can actually hear the audio. Um, but I'm uh, just going to quickly comment. So the surgeon is actually talking about his uh, laparoscopic instrument and how it gets difficult uh, to handle the instrument when his uh, gloves get wet um, because of sweat um, or uh, any liquid or blood on his hands. Um, so this is one of the aspects where we then later on uh, went along and made recommendations on how to improve the design of the handle of the device in order for the surgeon to be able to actually use it, even though his gloves are wet and a little slippery. Then another thing we often do are anthropometric assessments. So these are assessments on um, how the human body looks like, what forces people can, can apply. And in the context of um, sterile packaging, this is very important, for example, um, when it comes to, to ripping open packages. And some of the assessments we do is about the force that is acceptable or comfortable when opening these packages. Um, because as you can imagine, if you take a, let's say, 20-year-old American male, um, it might be pretty obvious that uh, he might have more force or might be able to more openly, more easily open a package than let's say a 60 year old um, Asian woman. And these assessments help to make recommendations for the design of the packaging to um, have the optimal force uh, that fits most users. Then of course, down here, we see formative and summative usability testing. The difference between formative and summative testing is that during formative testing, we usually have early prototypes of device. And the intention of formative testing is to improve the device design, while summative usability testing is done with a near or completely finished design or product. And the intention here is to show that the device is safe and effective to be brought to market. One of the tools that we often use is eye tracking. And again, I have a little video to show you here. So here you can see a person interacting with a camera um, package and the red dot indicates um, where the person is looking and obviously how long the person is looking at certain aspects. So here you can see him read through um, the labels and to look at the labels in more detail.
So one of the outcomes of these eye tracking studies are what we call a heat map. You can see that in the middle of the screen here. Um, and the colors indicate where a person looked and how long that person looked. So there's a couple things to notice here. For example, you see the red section in the middle or a little below the middle of the package. Uh, this means that the person looked there for quite a while. And the next step now would be to ask or to find out why the person looked there or kept looking there. And maybe this is because there's a term or word that is hard to understand. Um, so he had to read it a couple of times or got stuck while reading. Um, so this is something we would find out in this situation. Another thing, for example, to notice is that the lower section of the text, especially the small print, um, the participant did not look at all because there's no color indication. And here again, it would be interesting to find out why the person did not look there. Maybe he or she thought that the, important, uh, the information there is not important because it's such a small print. And then again, we would go ahead and um, see what information is there and how important it is and how we could actually change the design in order to make it more obvious and make sure that people are actually reading it. So of course, there's many more tools that we use during the usability engineering process, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them and actually now look at two tools specifically, which are of most importance in our context here today, which is the risk assessment and the summative usability. So I'll start with the risk assessment. The tool that we use here is mostly a USMEA, a use failure mode and effects analysis. And I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the classical failure mode and effects analysis that you use uh, during product development. And what we use is a very similar setup or a very similar uh, format, uh, but we just focus on use failures and their effects. So next, I want to walk you a little through the process of creating one of these um, UFMEAs and what you need to consider while doing this. So when assessing risk, um, there's a certain process to it, and I'm just going to walk you through it. So we'll start at the very left of the screen here with the task analysis. So of course, the first thing you need to find out is who are you users, what use environments do they use your product, and what um, task or operating principles do they actually apply to your product. So basically, who does what where. The next thing you need to consider are the hazards. A hazard is defined as a potential source of harm. And in our case of Sarah packaging, this could be the presence of bio burden on the outer packaging. So the outer side of the package is contaminated. Next in the chain of events, you have an initiating event or circumstance. This could be a use error or maybe an unintuitive interface characteristic or anything else. Um, for example, or our packaging, this could be that the user does not um, see the indication where to open the package. Next, we have, or this leads to a hazardous situation. A hazardous situation is um, defined as a circumstance in which people, property, or the environment are exposed to one or more hazards. In our case, this could be the user's unsterile hand coming in contact um, with the product or the inner packaging. This would then lead to a harm, which is defined as physical injury or damage to the health of people or damage to property or the environment. In our case, again, for example, this could be the contamination of the content of the packaging. And of course, for each of these categories, you have many, many things to consider. You have a lot of hazards, a lot of possible initiating events, many hazardous situations, and of course, many harms. And all these would go into your use failure mode and effects analysis. When you have done all of this, you would do the next step and determine the actual risk. Risk itself is, combined, is defined as the combination of the probability of occurrence of a harm and the severity of that harm. So in other words, how likely is it that something is going to happen and how bad are the consequences if it happens? 
you need to determine all of this because only by knowing about all of your risks, you can make sure they do not happen. So as a next step to show that your risks do not manifest, you would do a usability evaluation. And that's what I'll talk about next. So during usability testing, no matter if formative or summative, um, you always have kind of three phases. The first phase is creating the protocol. In the protocol, you detail how your usability tests are actually going to be run. What participants are you going to test? How many participants? What use environment? And there's actually a small section or <laughs> rather big section in the protocol that kind of looks like a movie script where every single use step that the participants are going to perform are listed one by one. So later on during the usability testing, we can actually score each of the use steps and make sure we did not skip anything and observed every use step and make sure that whether or saw that whether they were okay or if the participant made a use error or difficulty. Then during usability testing, we usually have the setup that in one room we have the participants that actually perform the tasks. In our case, this would be uh, two nurses, one sterile, one not sterile, where the one nurse presents uh, aseptically uh, the content of packaging to another nurse. And with them in the room, we usually have a moderator who leads the session and runs the participant through the different tasks that are happening. Then we have a one-way mirror that leads to another room. You can see that on the left side of the picture here, where we have uh, more people. And one of them is our um, um, observer, our um, second person that um, assists the moderator and also tracks everything that uh, happens in the room and uh, scores each task on whether it was an okay, a use error, or a close call. So we have actually two people observing what is happening in addition to a multi-camera view. Most of the time we also have um, some clients in the observation room as well. Um, and this is always very interesting because we may have designers, engineers, business people, and it's always, oh, most of the time, it's quite eye-opening for them um, to see how their product is, is actually being used in, uh, in an almost real environment that we created. Next, I'll show you a little clip um, of a usability test that we ran. This was actually informative, but um, the setup is rather similar, and I just want to, to highlight how these things uh, might look. We have a two-camera view here. You can see the participant, and uh, this was for a prefix range. And you can see the participant um, giving an injection into an injection pad, and on the right side, you can see the moderator um, that is observing and the participant um, through the slide. Um, If you have audio, I don't know if that is working, um, you would hear the participant talking about what she's doing, what is easy, what is more difficult. So we would later on use this video um, if we have any doubt or any question about the observation that we made. So we always have a detailed view of what happened that we can go back to and uh, do our analysis. After the testing is done then, we come to the last step, which is the reporting. And during uh, the reporting, we um, discuss every single single thing that we saw during the usability test. We would talk about and uh, analyze each uh, use error, each close call, each difficulty that we observed. And um, at the end, actually make the statement of whether or not um, the product is safe and efficient and can be brought to market. So this would close or finish my uh, presentation for today. Uh, thank you so much. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have now. Thank you so much.
Thank you, David. We really appreciate that presentation and we look forward to asking you lots of questions in the question answer period. Moving into our next agenda item, we are going to be seeing some videos, um, one of an EU hospital presented by Thomas Karras, and then also uh, one of a Chinese hospital um, narrated by Dr. Selena Chin. Thank you, and um, after this, we'll go into our um, discussion. One reminder. Hello everyone, this is Thomas from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for watching this. Uh, this video shows my colleague unpacking material that has just been delivered to our hospital showing how much cardboard boxes, plastic foil is actually involved in one of those deliveries. This is a colleague from another hospital. She just printed a pick list preparing to uh, pick this, the items that are needed for uh, next day procedure. First thing, she's preparing this cart with a few baskets. And the first thing she's going to pick is actually uh, a number of instrument sets that were packed and sterilized in this blue paper inside these metal baskets. Next thing is letting some smurfs pass and then continue with picking the material, the disposable material, um, which is stored in these plastic baskets as you can see. This is a card that just arrived from the logistics department in the basement showing how much material can be crammed into one of those cars. This next video is on um, the preparation of the sterile field uh, as done in our hospital and it shows my colleague opening the uh, package, the pouch in which we have a procedure pack and how she's draping it over the table which is actually uh, going pretty smooth and in this case the uh, outer package doesn't really matter to us, but actually that one is one of our least favorite packages because it's hard to open it and um, offering it to uh, the sterile colleague. What we uh, watch her doing now is something that is in some countries allowed and in some countries this is forbidden, uh, which means uh, the flipping on the table. You can watch her doing this here again. And that is due to the fact that uh, there's no real consensus or on the uh, matter of uh, whether this is sterile or not or dangerous or not. But in our case, um, speed is of uh, paramount importance. And since we don't have too much time, we have to be fast in opening the packages too. And therefore, as you can see, she's now struggling to get the package open because the plastic foil is actually um, charged with st static electricity, which makes it hard to open up. Next thing, what she's going to do next is um, opening a huge package, laying it on the table. And in this scene, um, this is actually me on the left donning my sterile gown. I'm helped by a colleague who is closing it from behind. And I'm currently in the process of donning my gloves, which in this case actually goes pretty smooth. No problems here. And once the material is in the sterile field, usually it's uh, pretty easy to handle. Now you see my colleague assisting me in wrapping my gown around me, making me ready for the procedure. This is uh, another colleague of mine uh, preparing for a procedure. And as you can see, there is a huge pile of material on her table wrapped in several layers of package material. Opening, this is a colleague of mine opening a package with a screw inside 
That's true for osteotomy. And um, first thing is, as you can see, the inside package. I'm sorry for the low quality, but the inside pa package isn't really much smaller than the outside package, outer package. Here she's taken another screw. First thing is trying to identify whether it's the right material because the label is hard to read. So she shows it to my sterile colleague. Next, she's struggling to uh, remove the plastic outer layer. Then she struggles to open the seal of the box, which makes it difficult to be quick. Here she takes out the little plastic bag. And in this case, this one here is actually pretty easy to open and to offer it to the sterile nurse which in that case has to open another package before she reaches the final product, which is a small little screw. And you can see the small screw being delivered in a huge package. Now here's another box that is hard to open for my colleague. She's struggling to get, to get the seal opened. And here we are once again are with a well, you know the babushka uh, principle, the babushka uh, dolls from Russia, a puppet in a puppet in a puppet. And this one here reminds me about that. Plastic foil, which is very tightly sealed. And here she's open up, uh, opening the third package with a f uh, definite material. Here you can see how hard it sometimes can be to read the labels to identify the right product. This uh, package actually has a pretty easy to open plastic uh, foil around it. And that one also went really quick, but here we have the problem what my um, what my circulating nurse just did is, for example, forbidden in some countries, so it's really hard to reach the uh, final product. And that was it for me. Thank you for watching this, and have a great Congress. When you enter the operating room in China, you will see one steel metal device storage room next to OR room. This is the cabinet where the surgical kit is stocked. They are all packaged by head bag. Head bag is the most commonly used configuration for surgical kit. This is another cabinet for surgical kit. Most kits are special designed or customized for different operations. What we see now are the storage room for guide wires, different catheters, introducers, and other medical devices. These devices are commonly used in minimally invasive surgery. These catheters are often packaged by pouch. Typically, these packages are hung up for storage to avoid being folded. This is an end of processes devices. You can see the protective package outside. This is an introducer. It is packaged by rigid tree. You can see that it has a clear opening position and identification. This is some low value consumable area which contains uh, surgical gowns, dressing, blazes, etc. Because most of the consumables are included in the surgical kit, these devices are mainly used as a backup. Now let's take a look at the preparation of steel field. This is a surgical kit we saw earlier and every patient will use it. The nurse first does a quick check on the integrity of the packaging and then look for the opening position of the handbag 
and then open it directly. The inner layer of the table sheet is a sterilized area, so the nurse's hands will not allow to touch any part of the inner side and any sterile medical devices when she prepares the operating table. The surgical kit is generally composed of gowns, drapes, and plastic trays according to the specific clinical applications and of a designated procedure. Now this nurse is opening several syringes. Please take a look. The packaging of the second syringes has been torn and damaged, which could cause fiber tears and has risk to contaminate the sterilized operating table. You can tell this packaging op opening is a one person operation. The devices are directly poured on the steel operating table. Since there is a risk to contaminate the steel field, a direct transfer to the steel field by the person that opened the steel barrier system is not recommended. This is an infusion set. After checking the information on the packaging and identifying where to begin opening, the nurse start to open the packages. After the steel operating table is ready, the surgery doctor is ready to go. This is a minimally invasive surgery for interventional therapy of liver cancer. The doctor needs to dress and wear gloves with aseptic technical and procedures and with nurses' help. In a different region, there are a little different between the procedures. What we see now is the packaging aseptic plantation process. The first step is to inspect the packaging, verify the information, and identify where to begin opening. Then the nurse opens the packages. Her hands will not touch the inside of the opening part of the packaging or touch any sterile contents. At the same time, she will open packaging so that the doctor can take the devices out of the packaging aseptically. The doctor's hands will not touch any unsteel area during the transfer. Now, let's look at the process of the packaging discard. The nurse first takes the packages to her workbench and records the information manually for the medical device traceability requirements. Then all the packages will be dumped in the blue ordinary trash container and disposed as a domestic, domestic garbage. Currently, there is no special medical plastic recycling treatment in Chinese hospitals. Now, let's take a look at the similar packaging opening for another operation, the interventional therapy for kidney cancer. 
In summary, the first step is to inspect the packaging, verify the information, and find the opening position. The second step is to open, peel the seals of the steel barrier system slowly, and create a large enough openings to remove the product without touching a steel area. For example, to fold the flaps backward to create enough large openings. The third step is to present and transfer. The device should be presented to the scrub it the doctor, make sure that there is no contact with any unsterile area during the transfer. Thank you, Selena and Thomas. Um, we are going to be heading into our question and answer session now. I'm gonna have each of the um, panelists show their camera and turn on their mics if they will. Um, so um, David, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself first since you are the first speaker. All right, thanks. Um, so as I already, uh, said during uh, my talk, my name is David Kosevento. I'm a senior human factors engineer and head of Design Science Germany, where we're doing all the kinds of uh, usability and human factors uh, studies and support uh, customers from um, a medical background or a pharmaceutical or medical device background with their usability engineering. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, sorry. Thank you, David. Jeez, I was looking at Thomas's name because I was going to go to him next. Sorry about that. Thomas, no can you introduce yourself as I botch it on the way in? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Thomas. Um, I'm a, a OR nurse uh, from the Netherlands, and I'm representing a social professional um, uh, organization uh, who represents uh, all the OR nurses from this country. And um, I have worked in several different countries, uh, in uh, several different ORs. Thank you, Thomas. Dr. Selena Chin, it is so different to refer to you as doctor, because um, I've always known you as Selena. Selena, please introduce yourself. Okay, and good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Selena. I'm in Shanghai, China now. Uh, it's great to meet you through the webinar. I worked for Dubang, China as directory and a standard hospital outreach leader. And prior to joining the Dubang, I had practiced uh, medicine as a radiologist and a surgeon for seven years. So just in the hospital you saw in the video, that is, uh, I worked for seven years. <laughs> so, and uh, it's my great honor to uh, meet you here. And uh, also I want to have discussion with all the expertise from the different uh, region and area. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Selena. And Melinda, last but not least. My name is Melinda Elamari. I'm the Educator and Quality Control Manager for Sterile Processing at Duke Raleigh Hospital. Um, I also have a background as a surgical tech. I scrubbed open heart surgery for eight and a half years, um, as well as some other procedures. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, everyone. So before we get started, um, I want to draw attention to the fact that, sorry about my reading glasses, um, they're going to glare, um, but I need them to be able to see and I need to read notes at this point. Um, before we get started, I want to draw attention to the fact that there were two different topics that we talked about today. Um, one was doing a usability study and one was a septic opening and um, transfer in an actual healthcare setting. And while they, they both overlap to a certain extent, they are two different um, topics in and of themselves, and we could probably spend at least a day talking about each of them on their own. Um, as we talk uh, about some of the questions that we have that came in, that we developed ahead of time, um, please note we're not necessarily going to spend a lot of time talking about aseptic um, techniques as much as potentially how packaging could have been designed better to help people use it better. Um, so there's that. I think it was really fun to see a couple of different um, situations around the world, but I wanted to make sure that we got those um, touched on. Uh, let me see. Okay, going through my notes here. Um, uh, 
I want to give a refresher on the requirements that are stated in 11607 as some of the clinicians may not be familiar with them. And this is um, the requirements for usability itself. So one is the usability evaluation for a septic presentation shall include an assessment of the ability to identify where to begin opening, the ability to recognize and perform the technique required to open the sterile barrier system without contaminating or damaging the contents, and the ability to subsequently present the contents aseptically. With that, I am going to jump into the first question. Uh, Melinda, since um, there was no US, US video, uh, I'm gonna ask all of the clinicians, um, as well as David, to talk about some of the first impressions um, of, of the video. Since there was no US video, can you share um, a little bit how it might be done a little bit different in the US so people can have at least a, a mental image of, of how things might be different? Yeah, so I think um, it's very surprising to see the two countries and how they do things and um, not so much how much different, but how similar so many things are. Um, that was really awesome to see those similarities. I think there are a few differences that um, would happen as far as, you know, technique goes. Um, so in, in particular, I think like there's a point where you can see in the video that Selena did give was um, the nurse kind of pushing the package to check uh, the package. We there we don't do that. There's no squishing. Um, we do flip open um, items onto our sterile field, um, and the way that we flip is more the controlled method of holding it and protecting, not so much flipping where it falls out, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many things that are very similar um, and it was really refreshing to see that sim similarities in those aspects that we do things. Excellent, thanks Melinda. Um, Selena, I'm gonna have you go next. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I would give you some the background of operating room in the videos. The, I can tell a little different because the operating room in Europe video is uh, just for the general open the surgery. So you can see a lot of the different uh, single used uh, the medical device be opened and be prepared. But the video we created in China hospital was in the local, the MRS, MRS means the uh, minimally invasive the surgery operating room. So most of the minimal Minimally invasive surgery will be used, they use the catheter, get well to finish all the operations. And typically, we use just a small, very small cart uh, in the body, and the medical device in such operation are kind of simple. So you cannot see them uh, many different uh, the, the disposable medical device. That yes, just that gives us some common sense. And, and, uh, and also, I want to give. Uh, um, talk a little about the, the Melinda mentioned the, the wrong practice. Yes, I can tell the, the another major issue happened in China hospital worker. The nurses uh, in, in China, the nurses always take, take trainings to check the packaging integrity by pushing the packaging and check if the leaking happened. Very straightforward. No pressure drop, no leak. That means good practice. However, pre pressure drops or leaking happened. That is bad package or contaminated package. That's not right at all for the all breathable, breathable medical package that apply to the EU sterilization. So that is also the reason we put a lot of efforts to train the, the current nurses in China to make sure they understand what is the right practice in package opening and the package integrity checking. Okay, thank you, Jen. Thanks, Lena. And I don't think that anyone is saying it's wrong. I think it's more that it's just different. I, and I think it's it's kind of, I think it would be fun to, to have a discussion about it completely separate from here. But um, I, I thought it was pretty interesting and, and not necessarily a bad way to identify that there may be an issue. Um, Thomas, uh, what were the differences that you saw? Um, well, I uh, saw a lot of similarities, actually, but the most Excellent. surprising that I saw was that the uh, um, circulating nurse in China was still wearing her gown and her gloves while presenting unsterile stuff. 
Um, and I uh, saw that she was also flipping things onto the table. Um, during my video, I perhaps use, uh, wrongfully used the word, the, the word allowed. I think it's uh, tolerated in Europe. Um, and it was actually interesting to see uh, how many similarities there are uh, looking at another country. Um, since I've worked in several min, uh, different countries, my, in my experience, every hospital is different, every country is different, so there's no uh, one line, but there's, it, it was actually fun to see that there are many, many things that these people do the same. When I think um, you, you just hit the nail on the head a little bit, Thomas, is that um, even when in one hospital, you might see people do things a little bit different, um, much less regionally or nationally or internationally. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but actually the fun part is that even within my own OR, there are people who would tolerate flipping on the table and there are people who don't. So you really have to check which colleague is in my OR uh, in order to know uh, how to behave. So, yeah, so, and it so, comes down to the training, right? So, how they were trained and where they learned how to do things, and how they, what, that's what they bring. So, this absolutely. is a good segue into David. Um, David, uh, usability. We, we've clearly got variability around the world. Um, how do we tie in how people actually do things as opposed to studying them doing things? Because my guess is what you saw in these videos is very different than what you will potentially see in person in a usability study. Um, can you talk about the nuance between those two? Uh, well, actually, um... The footage that we just saw was not that different from a usability study because first of all during a study we try to create a use environment environment that is as close as possible to the real world and um, i very much like the footage uh, or the commentary that thomas um, provided because this is exactly what we would want our participants to do in a formative usability study so we would want them to perform something and at the same time or afterwards tell us uh, what is not working for them, or where they're struggling, where are they having difficulties? Because only by observing and hearing from, from the real users, we can then draw conclusions on how to improve the actual product. Um, thank you. Uh, from a global perspective, um, do you have people doing studies uh, with people around the world or is that part of that pre-study where you may recognize the differences that your customers may have around the world, but you would then test for it in a, in a smaller setting? Um, well, there, there's, there's two sides to it. First of all, you need to consider the differences, the cultural differences uh, around the world when designing the product. Um, easy example here is that for, for Europeans and, and Americans, um, the color red usually means danger and something is not working. While, um, Selena, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, for an Asian population, um, or especially Chinese, um, the color red would be associated with, with uh, wealth and, um, and luck. So there's just some basic differences that you do <laughs> need to, to consider. Um, and even when, um, when running the studies, um, people from different cultural backgrounds can be quite different. So this is one of the reasons why we actually opened up the European office, because even between Europe and the US, where people would think, ah, oh, people are fairly similar, there's differences that you need to consider. So it's important to not just test one user population, um, but look at where you want to market your product and test accordingly. So do some people actually do studies in different geographical regions or do they typically just host it in one? Uh, absolutely. It, it often happens um, that we at least test in Europe and in the U.S. Okay. So we, we coordinate our teams between the U.S. And, and Europe to make sure the protocols are the same. Um, but yeah, you need the local population to see how they uh, read the labels, how they interpret the signs uh, to make sure it's safe and effective for everyone that intends to use the product. Sure, sure. Now I have to say one of the questions that came in was um, if there's a, a standard that people can use um, for usability in, in, their, in ISO 11607, there is a standard that is listed. 
Um, are, are there other tools available for people if they're trying to venture out on their own to do this? Um, I know that there are many consulting companies such as yours that will turnkey do it for them and help them through it. Um, but are there any other tools that people can use out there? Uh, well, yeah, as I said in my presentation, the, the two most basic um, documents that we use are um, IEC 6366, which is usability engineering for medical devices, and then uh, the FDA guidance applying human factors uh, to uh, the design of medical devices. Again, those are the two uh, standards that uh, we use most of the time, or actually are the foundation of everything that we do. However, these standards are not too specific. They don't take you by the hand and uh, walk you through the process step by step, um, which, which I kind of think is a good idea because it um, can be dangerous, I think, if you don't do usability properly, um, because it's always the subtle things that you need to notice. Um, just like um, in, the, in the video of the Chinese hospital, um, there were two instances where the nurse um, slipped off the packaging with one hand in one, one instance. I don't know if, if, if you saw that. Um, these things happen in a split of a second and this is where things can get dangerous. So you need to be trained, of course, to, to notice this and then to dig deeper and see why this happened and what you could do about it. Sure, sure. Um, which I, kind of brings us into the next question is, um, we, we currently, or we, we talked about what the requirements um, from a usability standpoint were, and this is to everyone now. Um, were the requirements of usability met? Um, and I know that you guys have a, a copy of the requirements in front of you if you wanted to reference those as well. Melinda, I'm gonna have you talk about that first. Yeah, so I think um, there, there were, like with the videos that we've seen, there were some areas that I think could expand on the usability study as far as the arena of where we're performing it, you know. So, and I guess that's my question to David of, you know, when we do usability studies, is it just one setting per se, or do we try and get multiple settings to see how that plays out, let's say, you know, like Selena was saying, this is a minimally invasive surgical area versus an actual operating room versus a trauma center. Um, how do we see if that is the same result we get in each area? So I think that, and then the other factor that I really was trying to figure out too is how do you take in consideration that like when you're doing the study and people know that they're being watched, they tend to do things different as versus if nobody's watching and hey you know mom's not here so let me play um so how do we take that into account when we're trying to factor in those studies david i'm going to have you hold off on answering that um, i'm going to have uh thomas i'm going to have you answer the question next um well i think you guys designing and making those uh, packages are doing a great job in in several aspects and i think uh if you look at it from uh, the point of regulations then yes you would meet the the requirements but in some cases i think there's room for improvement and i think uh the small package um if you remember the video where my colleague opened the small package with a little screw inside of it uh, you can see that, well, all regulations actually are met, but my colleague had uh, um, problems getting the package out of the outer layer. Uh, so I think um, meeting the requirements is not always the only solution. But uh, yes, I think uh, the requirements actually were met, yeah. Excellent, thank you. And um, David, I'm gonna have you touch on that one as well. If you wanna make a note on that, the, the meeting of requirements as opposed to other things that you can get and, and glean out of your usability studies um, that are outside of meeting requirements. Yeah. Lena, do you think that in the videos, the usability requirements were met in general? Uh, yes, uh, I, I just uh, realized that several things not, maybe is uh, needed to be uh, approved. For example, as I mentioned in the video, the nurse uh, took one syringe, Chinese nurse, one syringe, and dropped it in the operating operation table. 
it brought the risk of the contamination of the fiber tier. I thought we may need to consider this risk uh, during the packaging material selection and the packaging design. And uh, in some, an another uh, area improvement I thought is uh, in some tree design, I would like to add uh, um, two cart in the packaging. It will be easier uh, for both the right hand, both the right uh, handed or the left handed people. So that is my thought. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. David, I'm going to have you close up this part of the conversation um, with some responses of A, whether you, you thought that the requirements were met, and then to Melinda's and Thomas's um, comments, kind of touch on those with respect to how you would look at those things from a study perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually would depend on uh, the kind of study that you're running. So if you're doing a formative study where the goal is to improve the product, I would say the requirements are not met because clearly all of the products could have been improved. Um, so as part of the formative, we would closer look at, the, at what happened and how we could improve the product. In terms of a summative or validation study, I would say probably yes. But here again, um, it's important to not just look at what went wrong, but look at why it went wrong and do what I talked about earlier, do the root causing and um, then determine why certain mistakes happen. And um, then you could actually make the conclusion of whether or not the requirements were met. Um, if the conclusion of the root causing is that the product is um, as good as reasonably possible, then I would say yes. Um, however, if there's clear risk um, that is based on the design of the product, then things might be a little more tricky. Excellent. Um, one of the questions that commonly comes up, David, is, um, and this is in in the the, the other parts of the requirement um, for packaging as well as now for usability is how do I determine how many people I need to have in my study? Um, I have a former colleague that, that would contend if you are doing usability studies for your device already, which you should be doing, um, you would use that same sample rationale um, when applied to packaging. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very common question. We get that a lot. And um, there's an easy and a more difficult answer to this question. So um, the easy answer is the FDA says 15 people. Um, in Europe, there is not a specific number, but you need to have a rationale um, that, that tells um, how many people you use why. Um, basically, 15 is a good, good thing to start with. The more tricky question is, you need 50 pe 15 people per user group. And then the question is, what are your user groups? And there you need to look at the product and see who is actually interacting with the product and then determine if you have just one user group, maybe two, and in rare cases, maybe even three user groups. And per user group, again, you need 15 people. And a user group could be defined such um, as Melinda was touching on a little bit earlier. If your device is going to be used in the OR and potentially in an ambulance and then also in the ER, you might want to have a user group for each of those. Is that what I hear you saying? Uh, well, yes and no. So um, the one thing is the use environment. Okay. Um, and of course, you, um, you, there you'd, you'd have to make a, make a call. Of course, you cannot test every single use environment because every OR is different, even if you just have operating rooms. Sure. So you must group your use environments um, by kind of the severity of what can go wrong. Um, so it might be enough to just test the, like, the worst case use environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of the user groups, again, you, you look at, um, for example, the training of the people. Are OR nurses in the, the region that you're testing maybe trained exactly like the nurses that would be sitting in an ambulance? And if they are, you could just group them together. However, if an OR nurse has a different training um, than a nurse on another, on a regular ward, then it might be important to actually test both of these user groups. That's a lot of testing to do. <laughs> That's what we do. 
Yeah. Yeah. It gets, it gets big really fast, doesn't it? I mean, it seems simple in the respect of meeting the requirements, but there's a lot more that goes behind those three requirements um, to be able to prove them, uh, which I think becomes more clear or clearer and clearer as you jump into the concept of usability a little bit more. Uh, back to the clinicians for a second. This is this is a pop quiz. I promised you I would do these. Um, what's one of the worst experiences that you have seen um, in using packaging in your uh, past history? Selena, I'm gonna have you start with that one. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I can just, uh, I mentioned in the video, it's a similar happened in, in my period. When I, I opened the, uh, uh, a catheter during my operation in China. Once I find the packaging is is it cannot open very easily, and my 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 my, my patient is just in the in the operation table, and I cannot open that. So it delayed my uh is a is a delayed the 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 process and make me very mad. So the the packaging is is uh, very important for me. So the how make sure the packaging not be damaged, not be uh, toned and easy to open to present is very important for nurses and doctors that make make sure that all the operation could be going well very smoothly. So that is my. <laughs> so, so you saw on a frequent basis then um, packaging that that tore as it was being um, opened. Yeah, I think because in, in China sometimes, so especially for some you know and and uh, low end the medical device that is. Uh, uh, such as a paper pouch and the, that the people, the, the, the mechanical strength is not very good enough. So if the, the, the nurse or doctor tears very quickly and uh, strongly, that easier to be toned. So that is uh, damaged. So that's why I saw that video that the nurse didn't change the, the, the medical device. If the, the damaged, they should change the medical device uh, immediately because it, uh, it cannot be used. It can can raise the risk on the contamination and is not a safety for the patient. So that okay. will be the yeah problem, big issue for the for the operation for the you know, patient. Okay. So one thing I noticed in in the Chinese video compared to the EU video is it seemed like the the physician was having more interaction with the packaging than um, I've seen before. Is that common in China where the physician actually interacts with the packaging or is that more due to the interventional nature of the procedure that was happening? It depends on the different procedure. Yeah, it's okay. different. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Um, Thomas, I'm going to have you answer um, the question next. Um, I actually have two examples. Um, one of the examples I have um, uh, is that I, uh, uh, I had a procedure where a patient was uh, heavily bleeding and I was struggling to open the, anti -co uh, the, the coagulant uh, that the surgeon needed at that situation. Uh, uh, so it was actually a, a, a lot of time lost in which the patient was losing a lot of blood. And the second situation was uh, where um, one uh, producer of orthopedic implants used two different sets of packages, uh, which were actually labeled in the same way. And in which, um, well, due to shortage of uh, staff, I, I couldn't make a clear video of that. But usually uh, a, an orthopedic prosthesis is wrapped in a plastic bag, which is then put into a plastic um, box inside of a plastic second box. So uh, in, uh, usually the inner plastic box is already sterile. And this company had 50% uh, of the pr uh, products that they delivered uh, in, a, uh, uh, in both packages sterile. And in the other one, we have opened the uh, first layer of package and the second layer was not sterile, but we still took it onto the sterile field, not knowing that it wasn't sterile. And fortunately, no patient has suffered any kind of infect, uh, uh, severe infection. But uh, uh, I can imagine that you all are uh, equally shocked as we were when we heard that this package wasn't sterile. Sure, sure. I'm going to add another question onto this right now. Um, and please don't mention any company names. Um, are there certain 
devices from certain companies that you've identified that you really struggle with using and so you use alternate because of the packaging and your ability to use it? Um, no, not, uh, the, the package has never been a reason to switch from one product to, the, to another. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Melinda, mm -hmm. you're up. So like Thomas, I do also have two examples. So my first example is when I scrubbed heart, um, the valve, when we do valve replacements, they come in a cup and to get them out of the cup you have to take the handle and screw it down onto the actual valve and then pull it out so i was in a case and i went to grab the valve out um, and then the nurse the circulator holding onto the cup it act when i pulled it it actually hit the valve itself and wound up contaminating the valve and so the sad part was that was the last one on that size that we had. Um, so the surgeon had to do some real big time maneuvering and we had to get um, the rep to bring one in in a hurry uh, to, to to use a new valve. The other um, example I have is during an aortic aneurysm, a uh, patient was bleeding. Once we cut the chest, the patient just started bleeding everywhere and the surgeon at that time had a procedure where he would take towel clips and clip the chest together um, to help kind of control some of the bleeding for the time being um, and getting the towel clip open out of a chevron feedback, um, was extremely difficult for the circulator because you know her hands were wet and the pack just kept ripping and it wasn't opening um, kind of like in Selena's video where that syringe rip, that's what was happening with our Chevron pack and the peel, it was just not peeling opening, open, it was ripping and we couldn't use them and so she would have to run and grab more. And I mean, it, it wound up being like three or four before we even got to having two to hold the chest together. Is that a common occurrence? Uh, yeah. <laughs> More than you'd want to count, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. And to to your question, Jennifer, with um, that you asked Thomas, you know, I can think of multiple that are the most problems uh, problem packaging. Um, the one thing is we haven't changed products because of the packaging, because it here it's based on what's the surgeon's preference of item used, right? So the packaging becomes the less idea or thought process on why we're purchasing something, right? And so it just becomes on the circulator and the scrub tech to figure out how to get it in a sterile fashion. So even though you may we, have to struggle quite a bit, we're frustrated. <laughs> yeah, we're the ones who are suffering, but you know, it is what it is. Sure, understood, understood. Um, David, what are your thoughts on um, what the three of them have just shared from a usability perspective? Um, it, all those instances were very interesting. And um, it just, uh, again, shows what, what we see a lot during the studies. Um, no matter how imaginative you are and how creative you are ahead of your study, you can never imagine all of the things that would actually happen. Um, so always be prepared to be surprised, I would say. So David, is interviewing the, um, the, the people who are doing the study after the study and asking them um, those expanded questions, is that part of doing a study? Yes, Probably absolutely. more on the formative side of it, I would guess, than the summative side, but... Yeah, so, so during the formative, you would encourage them to talk throughout the process and sometimes even interrupt them and say, hey, stop, I saw you did this and that. Can you explain why you did that and um, how you usually do that um, to get as much information out of the participants as possible? Um, during a summative or validation study, you just leave the participant completely alone during their action or during their process because you would never want to interfere with how they do things. And only after the um, hands-on part of the study is done, 
then you go back and start asking the questions and go like, hey, um, during your first step, I saw you looked at the package for a couple of seconds. Um, what did you look at or what did you see? Um, so in a validation, we do all this, but at the end, because we don't want to interfere with the participant. Understood, understood. Um, so along that vein, comparing what the requirements are to what one can get out of a usability study, can you share some things that um, people can get out of the study that can enhance the user experience, um, either actually bring them delight? I mean, um, I, I probably think about packaging more than the average person. And my guess is um, even the clinicians would probably say that through this process of, of doing this panel, they've been thinking about packaging more. It's usually probably more a subconscious thing that's going on as they're using packaging. Um, but I've been delighted before in using packaging and surprised by it. Um, can, can we get that out of these studies as well as um, how do those subconscious expectations come out of the clinicians through the study that, that, that you as the studier um, pick up on and draw out? Yeah, so, so again, there's, there's a couple of sides to this. Um, so the requirements in in the standards are the like the bare minimum that you should do or you have to do um if you want to create a good product doing the bare minimum might not be uh the thing to do mm -hmm. um so it's it's always good to to do a little more than the bare minimum and um the bottom line of what you can get out of usability testing is good products um and products that make people happy. Um, and there's, there's, of course, different sides to usability. On the one hand, you have the user satisfaction where uh, people like your product and people um, um, have, have delight in using your product or buy your product because they like it, they have a good experience with the product. The product does exactly what you ex the people expect it to do. On the other side, there's, of course, the business aspect because, um, Let's look at packaging. If um, a package um, opens incorrectly and an item falls down on the floor, is contaminated, you need a new item. Things are pretty expensive in operating rooms. And if, if an expensive item is dropped on the floor, you need to replace it. Uh, another business aspect is of how fast are people going through the process. And the better the usability of the product, um, the faster and more safely people can can go through the process. You saw that in the video that Thomas uh, showed, how incredibly fast people were handling the, the products. And I was just amazed to again see that. And this is only possible if you have a product with good usability. And again, faster processes save time. So this again relates to the business aspect of uh, good usability. Sure, sure. Um, so we already asked the clinicians, um, and this is kind of turning the, the prism a little bit, about uh, where they've identified where they don't like it. Can you guys also share a spot where you've been um, surprisingly delighted or um, happy uh, about using a package? Um, oh, sorry. Um, Tomas, I'm going to have you answer that one first. Oh, okay. Um, yes, indeed. Um, uh, there are several uh, examples where, for example, um, uh, where you have uh, a, a plastic uh, uh, pouch around the package where there's a, um, a predetermined breaking line, uh, which makes it very easy to open, cardboard boxes that are easy to open, um, uh, products that are easy to present to the uh, uh, circle, uh, to the to the scrubners. Um, yes, there are very, very many, uh, uh, very good examples. Um, so, have they caught you by surprise, or did you? Um, was there a certain like satisfaction that came in using it that you that you didn't realize you'd have? Um, I, I'm bad. Difficult to say Putting because on the, um, on the spot, I've been working in the OR for about uh, approximately 30 years, so I'd, I'd say there's nothing much that surprises me anymore. <laughs> um, there is user satisfa satisfaction, actually. Uh, if I get a new product, um, and I think um, 
if you uh, remember the video where uh, uh, in the first uh, part where my colleague opened a screw, um, actually the box, the cardboard box was pretty difficult to open, but there is a pre, uh, um, um, there's this opening line that was very easy to open. And I, I, I was really kind of surprised to have a package that is so easy to do, yes. Um, okay. Usually, mm, we don't we don't focus on that part and uh, that is due to the fact that we have a, a huge workload and um well what uh, david just said we have uh we have a lot of experience and so we are pretty fast um i don't think me or my colleagues we would actually uh, really be focusing on uh, the, the the user friendliness of a product until we uh, have a product that is uh, causing adversity. Okay, so it's safe to say if it um, if it if it behaves the way you think it's going to, um, whether yeah. conscious or subconscious um, expectation of it, you don't think about it. Not really much. Um, no, no, it's exactly like that. Yeah. Okay, but when there's a problem, then you get kind of mad. Uh, yes, because, uh, well, most of the time uh, it's not us being mad, but it's um, uh, the surgeon who is performing the procedure who is trying to speed things up. So we're sure. in between the, the frustration of the, the product. Well, if we would have time, then we would solve the problem ourselves, but there's always another group of people who is trying to uh, push us. Sure, so sure. Okay. Melinda, how about you? Any delights that you've come across in packaging? Um, well, I, I think unlike you, Jennifer, is a whole delight in packaging. You know, <laughs> I think it's all like Thomas, you know, it's one of those things that it's just there and we deal with. Um, but I will say having been being part of more packaging conferences and knowledge on it um, has really brought in things to light to me um, and the way I look at stuff differently. So I'm getting a little more towards the line of the light on packaging. Um, but for the most part, I think like what David was saying, when something goes wrong with a package, you know, that's it. Like it's one of those things like as a, a scrub or um, in the operating room, if I see, oh, well, we have to open this, I'm like, oh, man, like, I hate <laughs> opening that thing. Like, I literally want to cry. Um, it's so bad. And then, but, you know, and then, I mean, I guess on other things, you know, you don't think of it, you're, it just becomes second nature. You're just like, oh, yeah, give me, you know, a pack of laps or a pack of Raytex or whatever it may be. And, you know, those are easy to get. And you're just like, yeah, bam, let's go. Um, but there are certain things that you really want to cry when you have to open it or you have to get it out of the package. It's painful. Understood. Understood. Selena, um, in your oh, yes, days. I, I, <laughs> I realized the one thing I, I, uh, I find in the video that is uh, in the Europe, the packaging storage that the packaging sometimes to be crammed in storage shelf. So the, the that is uh, is uh, is a uh, risk. To, to make the, the, the packaging damaged or be, uh, be punctured or be, or be, uh, be damaged. So the material selection should be considered both the mechanical strength and the low fiber tip. And another thing is about the opening section of packaging should be big enough. It should be easier to find and big enough for the nurse or the doctors to, to be handling. That is uh, because I always uh, heard from the medical device manufacturing engineering, they, they want to, the, the cost of saving, they made the opening area section very small. So that is not good as a practice uh, the, the, for the packaging, the, the accepted presentation. So another thing I, I thought, maybe we can, we can find some double poach, double tree, that will be good as a packaging design, packaging the, the configuration for the risk risk uh, uh, control and for the contamination control. Yes, that is my thought from the video. Yes. Okay, and thank you. Yes. Um, sadly, our time is starting to come to a close and I'm going to jump um, back down to the last question that I wanted to ask 
if there's one thing that you want the attendees today to take away, what would it be? Um, I'm going to start out with you, David. Yeah, um, so I would go with the following. Um, at first, you would always think that the clinicians, the surgeons, and the nurses are responsible for the life of a patient. But it's actually us as engineers and managers too. And we're responsible to have safe and effective products. Um, so I would say my bottom line would be usability saves lives. Excellent. That's it. That's thank you. Thank you. I I, I don't know that that's often and shared. We're done. <laughs> Melinda, why don't you go? You go next. What, what's your What's your key <laughs> takeaway? Like, on that note, I mean, <laughs> that was like a mic drop, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so I think for me, the takeaway would be just knowing that success is a team effort and initiating conversations between two groups. Um, is that first step in success. Um, right now, we have a severe lack of communication between manufacturers and end users. Um, so we need to help bridge that gap. I personally had no clue what was involved in packaging until I started becoming involved in the Kilmer Packaging Group um, conference and having deal, uh, conversations with Jennifer and around packaging. And it's just amazing because for me, a peel pack was a peel pack. And then I learned, nope, there's a Chevron peel pack. So now every time I'm like, no, that's a Chevron peel pack, guys. <laughs> um, so, you know, just being able to learn what is involved and what it takes to manufacture a packaging product and dealing with that. I think we really are doing each other injustice by not coming to the table and having conversations um, before putting stuff out on the market. Excellent. Great, great point. Selena, I'll have you take the next um, spot. Uh, okay, a lot of things I want to say. <laughs> the, um, the usability will reduce the risk of infection from package actually. So anytime uh, we will put the safety of a patient as a first priority, so it will consistently drive new design, new technologies for this purpose. And uh, I know everyone will be noted in the ISO, finding the ISO 11007, there are one statement calls for the steel barrier system is essential to ensure the safety of the terminally steroid medical device. If possible, I would like to add one more statement is that a steel barrier system is essential to ensure the safety of patient. So the usability study will contribute more on it. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Selena. Thomas, I'm going to have you go real quick because we have to close up on time. Well, the only thing I can say is I concur with everything the other speakers just said. And uh, I want to thank you for all your efforts in providing us with a good package. And if you can do that in a way that we don't have to notice the package anymore, then you have done a great job. And I'd really uh, like to invite you to, to, to create that bridge between the producer and the end user a little bit more. I'll be in touch with you then, Tomas. Um, Melinda kind of touched on it a little bit. All right, thank you panelists. Thank you attendees. We really appreciate your time today. Um, we're gonna close out here. I wanna share that um, from a slide perspective, we will be um, sharing these. When our survey for the event goes out, please make sure you answer that because that is your key to getting to the slides. Um, as far as recordings go of the event, um, we're working through permissions on that, so they may or may not be available. Um, there is clearly uh, delicate um, topics that we covered here today, and we want to make sure that everyone um, is is um, safe from misuse of it, I guess. Um, tomorrow, we have our last day of our three days. Thierry Wagner is going to be sharing with you a panel with regulatory experts from around the world. Um, FDA and uh, notified bodies will be with him talking about that. Um, any questions that we did not answer during the session today, we'll be following up with you afterwards. Um, let me make sure I got everything. I I think I have everything. So one last time, thank you so very much. Uh, we really appreciate your attendance. We appreciate your participation from the panel. Um, and we'll be with you again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.